Hey, Jesse, how you doing? Can you hear me? So, what's yeah. up, man? How is it oh, going? Oh, there's lots of Jessies on this call. <laughs> yeah, there's two Jessies. Hey, Jesse. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. You just appeared for us. Um, great. Yeah, why don't we just kick it off? Uh, Jesse, yeah. thanks for hopping on. Um, this just goes on auto record, so uh, I usually try to do it in one take, but if you need to edit something, let me know. Um, but we've got Jesse Randall here from Sweater Ventures. We've previously had Rachel Sachs, who's a Sutton alumni, uh, come back and kind of tell her journey about, talk, talk about her journey into getting into venture. Um, so Jesse was kind enough to kind of lend his time out to, um, to tell us his story and maybe tell us a little more about what's going on with, um, with the vision for Sweater Ventures. And, you know, just excited. I, I just feel that Venture capital is unbundling, and there's just so many tech platforms um, that are really supporting, you know, workflows, uh, supporting just services, and just um, just handling the data better. So excited to to hear a little more about your story and and you know how you got to where you are. So maybe we can kick it off and learn a little more about you know where you went to school, where you grew up, what your parents did, and um, how that took you into into venture and now sweater ventures, and then maybe we can play it by ear as we as we navigate. Yeah, yeah. Happy to happy to start back with uh, the early childhood. Dig into my psyche a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let's just say that I, I didn't grow up in a situation that lent itself to the traditional venture path. Um, yeah. I actually grew up uh, in a farming community on the outskirts of uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, actually on the Idaho side of Jackson. Grew up chasing cattle and building barbed wire fences and tossing hay bales. You know, it was a great life and a great way to grow up. Um, my dad always said he wasn't raising cattle. He was raising kids and mm -hmm. he did a good job of, of uh, working in that. We had a really big family. So um, I'm actually shockingly hold, hold on to your seats. I'm the ninth of 10 children. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. My dad's really, one out of eight. My dad's the oldest out of eight. Awesome. So it's a, it's a lot of fun over the holidays. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is. It does make for entertaining family reunions. <laughs> um, but I mean, one thing that taught me was just the foundations of really hard work, uh, immediate consequences to not making wise decisions. Um, and then my parents just emphasized education in the hugest way possible. So I've got three brothers that are doctors, uh, one that's a patent attorney. Uh, my sister's all very married very smartly as well with very accomplished people from vets to partners at PwC. And, you know, so we've all definitely evolved beyond the farm life, but the farm life is what gave us our foundation really. Right. Yeah. So, um, I wouldn't trade my, my farm life and, and my childhood for anything. Um, but that did lead me to, uh, getting outside of the Idaho territory, if you will, uh, ended mm -hmm. up getting a great scholarship, uh, at Utah state university, did finance and economics there. Um, eventually moved my way down South a little further to the Thunderbird school of global management, got my MBA in conjunction with uh, a master's of environmental policy at the Vermont law school. Um, and after that, I ended up kind of wandering my way into venture and the whole accelerator and software world uh, worked for um, an accelerator in Scottsdale, Arizona, back when accelerators were really cool uh, back in like the 2011, 12, 13 timeframe. Uh, built that from the ground up, operated a team of 30 people um, and pushed five cohorts through that program. And um, they ended up raising a venture fund while I was there. So I did due diligence for the venture fund and conducted all that stuff. And then since then, I, you know, I worked for some, um, you know, some different private companies and ended up working on Sweater eventually. We can get to that later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. And um, what was the typical career path of people that grew up where you grew up? Were they, did they stay in the farming community or were a lot of the next generations itchy to get out and explore the world? Uh, I'd probably say it's like a 70-30 like a split, you know, yeah. about 70% stayed local in some way, shape or form. 30% mm -hmm. took off and did other things or married outside the area or whatever. Um, sure. but yeah, I mean, those that left, it's really funny. I don't know what it is. It's just an Idaho thing or what, but, um, like the only worthy thing to aspire to was to become a, either a dentist or a doctor. So like, okay. if you didn't do one of those two things, then it was like, you weren't worthy. <laughs> and it took me a while to actually break that mentality because I was planning yeah. on going to med school myself, um, sure. until I discovered how much I love business. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah. I'd, I'd say a unique trend that you probably are aware of too is just the uh i'm just kind of looking here i mean utah is only like eight hours away there's just a weird 
concentration of people doing fund admin work in, in Utah. And there's a couple tech companies there too, but um, you know, they've got like Cornerstone and they got Assured and, you know, just a bunch of other uh, services for fund admin. So I think when you think about just services that you'll always need, you're always going to need a doctor. You're always going to need to have a dentist, but you always got to pay taxes, right? That's never going to go away. So I, I kind of thought about that uh, when I was a kid, you know, just what, what industries are always going to just be essential no matter what. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that is the stability of it all, right? Like, I mean, I've got, I think six buddies that I, I played sports with in high school and they're all doctors of some sort. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny actually. Sure. I mean, I'm Indian, right? So enough said, I mean, half of us are <laughs> doctors and engineers, right? So <laughs> not to, not to awesome. call out the, uh, the ethnicity here, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I think parents and it really the, it goes back to kind of maybe, uh, your parents mentality, right? So talk to me about, you know, my parents were like, look, Joel, you can either be an engineer or a doctor, you know, that's kind of the, the way to be successful. So what, what's kind of some things that you've seen as far as just parents evolving their thought process of, um, you know, just what, what, what they think their kids should go into now, you know, Kevin O'Leary, uh, recently said that he's changed, uh, his recommendation for what kids could, should go into when they, uh, when they graduate college and it used to be just engineering, but now what's super valuable is people who can take a technical concept and summarize in like a 30 second video and push it on TikTok. So I think these content creators, uh, people that are able to kind of distribute content, um, that's been kind of a unique uh, skill set that everybody can do. You know, people who are entrepreneurs, they could be brilliant entrepreneurs, they're brilliant product people. But if you can't communicate that clearly in two seconds or a one line, or a lot of times you can lose your audience. Um, so with that in mind, you know, what have you seen evolve as far as kind of what parents think, uh, you know, it has, has a lot of the conventional wisdom stuck around around your peers? Or have you seen that change to, to push parent uh, to have parents kind of push their kids to, to find what they're excited about? Yeah, I, well, it's an interesting and like pretty complicated subject, honestly. I mean, yeah. you look back at like when my parents were raised, I mean, my parents were raised in the 50s, you yeah. know, and the world just wasn't changing. I mean, it was changing, but like mm -hmm. from a fundamental perspective, the way to, to success was still pretty defined and it stayed that yeah. way probably through the 90s. But mm -hmm. from the 90s till now, I mean, things obviously everything's just changed tremendously. You know, I have yeah. family members, nieces, nephews that were born in the 90s, you know, and their parents taught them certain things and they came out of school. And none of it was relevant. Right. So yeah. I think that even more so now what we're looking at, you know, you can't put your kid on a career path um, from yeah. a parenting perspective because the world's going to be so dramatically different by the time that they actually get out into the workforce that there's nothing you can do now to actually put them in a in you know, like in a specific pipeline that's going to create mm -hmm. a certain thing. I mean, you could do that and be a doctor, but yeah. there's so much more well beyond that, that you can create. Uh, and I think that to your point, right. Um, like core skills around communication and the ability to, um, uh, to define and relay complex ideas is the kind of stuff that um, you can learn, but takes a lot of practice. And those that are good at it are going to be the ones that are really on top of the pile in the next 20 or 30 years, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and I mean, one thing I'll add too is just because you pursue a certain career path, you may not be happy, right? If you get, I think what could happen, mm -hmm. the, the downstream backlash that you can get is, uh, you know, you do what your parents did. And, you know, you do what your parents told you to do. And then you're, um, you're like this 40 year old successful surgeon that really wanted to be a guitarist, you know, and, uh, and you kind of hate your parents for it. Um, so I think, uh, that's, yep, then that's there's that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I know so many people like that, you know, I yeah. mean, like, frankly, most of the doctors I know what their career path is now is basically just, um, what would you say? Uh, trying to retire as soon as possible because they hate what they do. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing every day and it's a grind and mm -hmm. there's a ton of risk involved in it from a litigation perspective and they don't really get to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, even though that's, they, they went to school because they enjoyed the schooling. They don't enjoy the execution all the time. Yeah. Um, and they're just trying to retire as fast as possible. We've got feedback loud and clear from the sweater perspective. They just want to get out of the system. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, well, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, happiness is a is a helpful framework because if you get up every morning at least somewhat excited and 
you're looking forward to the day, right? I mean, that that's kind of a derivative of mental health and, and just um, living with some type of purpose because life is short, right? What's the point of doing all this if you're miserable? Because uh, you don't know how long you're going to be around. You don't know how long your loved ones are going to be around. So you want to make sure what you're doing some point is impactful and you're excited. You know, obviously to get to your goal, sometimes you got to, you know, take take the jobs that are less sexy to build those skill sets. So I think for me, it's kind oh, of yeah. been, it's been a little strategic. I, I've i taken less attractive jobs that have been in less attractive locations, but, you know, just try to think about the long term. Like hopefully those skills will will add value so I can move to a location where I'm happy uh, living, right. and, you know, <laughs> doing the kind of work I'm doing. I mean, there's, yeah, there's been a couple, I, I've had twists and turns in my career too. Um, but, you know, to your point, you know, I'm happy. I wouldn't change anything. I'm happy with the journey and, and, you know, trusting mm -hmm. the process. And I think that's what, um, that's what makes it all worth it, I guess, in the long term. Yeah. So. Well, and, and part of what I've discovered too, that I feel like is a very different mentality than my siblings who all tend to be Gen X is pretty mm -hmm. much where almost all my older siblings land. And yeah. then my mentality is that, you know, happiness is not a destination. It's not a goal that's in the future. You know, you're not going to be happy when you have this net worth or when you graduated from this thing or when you retire early or whatever, right? Like there's so much of life to live between now and then. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it needs to be a balance of how you, you know, deploy resources um, to discover and experience life along the way and not just be so heads down and so focused on overachieving that you get to a point where you're, you're freaking miserable yeah. and you might retire at 48. But mm -hmm. now you're 48 and you haven't done anything except yeah. work and go to school. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much more to life than that I've discovered. And I've, I've enjoyed, you know, kind of living along the way. And I think that yeah. the generation that's really coming through right now sees it that way. And that, that creates kind of an inherent conflict, I think, with uh, yeah. generations that have come before. But I also think that it's a way healthier way to live and a way to find happiness along the way, like you said. I agree. I mean, tell me what you think about this, too. I mean, I, I've got a never ending checklist of things I have to do. And, um, you know, these days, if I don't get all of them done and, you know, this weekend, right, I was supposed to get a bunch of stuff done this weekend, but I got to spend time with my son and, you know, kick the soccer ball around. And I think sometimes we're too hard on ourselves. We're like, hey, you know what? We didn't get all 10 of the items done. So I, I think it's OK if you still didn't get everything done. You know, I think you, as long as you kind of prioritize the top things and and, you know, really bang out the checklist as much as you can, I mean, um, I think you're fine, you know, as long as you get it and mm -hmm. get to it at some point and, and, you know, address the critical items first. Oh yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, that checklist is always there. The checklist is never yeah. ending just because there's 10 on it today and you do five of them. You just got 10 more tomorrow. I mean, yeah. it's, it's always there. And I think that it's a matter of, of effort and figuring out how to prioritize your life. You know, my mom, uh, <laughs> I lost track of the number of times she must've said this to me because it's my favorite quote. Uh, she said, you always have time for the things you put first. And it sounds so stupid, obvious, but yeah, too much. I think too often in our life, we allow ourselves to be kind of bullied around by the obligations that we put on our own shoulders, yeah. you know, and at, at some point, like you need to clear your headspace and clear the obligations that you are choosing to put on your own plate and stop making excuses that well, I have to do all these things. It's like, no, you don't. You obligated yeah. yourself to do that based on the choices that you've made in your life. Yeah. And so if you know somebody complains about, oh, I just don't have time to spend time with my kids. It's like, no, you are choosing yeah. to obligate yourself in a way that you are not prioritizing that. And that's your choice. If that's the sure. way you're going to live your life, that's fine. Personally, yeah. I try to not do that as much as possible. I still yeah. miss the mark all the time. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, you know, we have time for the things that are most important because those are choices. Yeah. Yeah. And it's prioritization. I mean, it's really, if, it, if it's important, it'll get done, especially if it's time sensitive, right? If there's something that you got to uh, take care of when it comes to tax season, you know, that's number one, right? And, and, you know, the other things that are, that need to be done, but are not critical, you know, nobody's going to die if it gets done tomorrow. So I think you're right. I mean, if it, if it is important, it gets done. Um, Unless you're a yeah. doctor, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, and then there's a, there's a whole corny dating analogy too. Right. I mean, if you, you know, if you, you know, when you're dating, I'm, I'm married and I got a little one, but um, you know, just with, with uh, you know, meeting, you know, fundraising and meeting LPs and even just dating the whole law of attraction. Right. I mean, if people, 
if it, if something is important to somebody, you know, no matter how busy they are, even if you're trying to talk to an LP or an investor, right? If they're if they're interested in what you have to offer, <laughs> or if you're, you know, get, going back to dating analogy, people will make people will make time for things that they're excited about and they care about, even if they're swamped. Um, they'll they'll mm -hmm. you know table other things to to prioritize. So oh um, yeah, and that's is, like when working with investors. Yeah. It's my number one to know, like to gauge how excited they actually are is mm -hmm. how much they prioritize their time for you. If yeah. they're putting you off and they, they want to have their next conversation in two weeks, you know, they're not that interested. And personally, yeah. you know, I, I kind of I manage them differently than those that are like, sure. hey, do you have time in, in two days to talk again? You know, it's very yeah. different when they want it. You know, they want it. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think there's different tactics that we can talk about as well when it comes to fundraising. Um, how to build the pipeline, how to reach out to investors. Um, and then I think, you know, I'm really excited about what you guys are thinking through when it comes to just reinventing uh, venture and, you know, the whole scouting process and, and all that. I know some of it is under wraps, um, but, you know, if there's um, maybe, you know, if you're allowed to kind of just talk about the story, you know, why sweater as a name, it sounds really cozy because it's starting to slowly get a little chilly here in New York. Um, not Not that much chilly, but, it's a little chilly. October is like my favorite month of the year because you could wear kind of like a thin, thin jacket. Um, so, uh, you know, with that in mind, tell me about sweater. How you came up with the idea, uh, the name, and <clears throat> yeah. um, and you know the vision. Yeah, well, I think uh, it'll resonate with your audience because um, you know, and the good folks that you work with. Because mm -hmm. this all started because I went to go start a venture fund. Um, yeah. in Phoenix. Uh, I'd been in Phoenix for eight years. That's where I worked in the venture community. And there's just no institutional capital there that actually operates in, in the greater Arizona region. And so I was like, well, screw it. Why am I waiting for someone else to do this? I should do this. And I jumped in and yeah. started looking at the process of, of putting everything together. And it was about two months in that, uh, at least at the time, uh, I realized I was not allowed to write a check into my own fund because I was not accredited. And oh, wow. I just remember thinking, I knew that rule before, like I knew the accredited mm -hmm. status rule, but I, I'd never been the one really locked out from something I really wanted to do. Yeah. And it made me curious more than anything, started diving in on the 1940 Investment Act and all this you know, history behind accreditation requirements. And at the end of it, it basically says, if you're not wealthy, then you're not smart enough to understand this and we need to protect you. And just this condescending tone that I was like, look, mm -hmm. if I'm included in that category, then this is archaic and there's gotta yeah. be a way to do this differently. Maybe that was fine in the 40s, maybe the 70s. We have so yeah. much, you know, inf access to information now and education. Like it shouldn't be this way. And, that's and my, my fundamental out. issue with that too is, you know, there's there's people that you know earn 50, 60k a year, and they're dropping 15 to 20 thousand dollars on Bitcoin and and Tesla. So uh, you can still invest in other asset classes and invest as much as you want. Um, so that that kind of still baffles me how, you know, it's still difficult to invest in private companies mm -hmm. when you can, I guess, maybe the fact that they're public and they're reporting, um, that's kind of the way to protect, you know, the investors. But the, the check sizes, you know, there's people that are non accredited that are still investing um, significant amounts of money for, for their for their income. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, right, I think that, you know, what we saw coming out of the whole GameStop thing that happened earlier this year, yeah. or whatever, is people came out of that with this awareness that mm -hmm. we really are locked out of so many assets. Yeah. And that at the end of the day, we don't want the government telling us what we can and can't invest into. We want to be able to put our money where we feel is best. If, if I can go lose all my money on crap staples, or I can go buy freaking lottery tickets, yeah. and, you know, invest in some crazy next generation version of Dogecoin that's going to crash why can't I put money into a startup, right? I mean, yeah. it's provided good returns for 40 years, um, you know, or put it into a hedge fund or, you know, go put it into commercial real estate or whatever. And these categories are all slowly opening up and becoming established. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting data point, I sat down with a guy um, from Canada uh, who was very deep into trying to understand and open up the accredited investor space here. And he was talking about Canada. There was, it's interesting context because there was never a 1940 Investment Act equivalent to Canada. Sure. So, Companies could go and raise directly from their neighbors and friends and family, always. It's never changed. So the culture yeah. there is that naturally households 
allocate mm-hmm. 10 to 20 percent of their their investing portfolio into private companies and coffee shops That's interesting high growth companies and whatever and he yeah. said in this one province um i don't remember which one it was but it was not whichever one toronto's in mm-hmm. <laughs> um they raised two billion dollars a year for private entities in that one province it has a population of about four million people so it's about the size of utah Wow. And they raised two billion a year That's from crazy. that one province from from independent households, you know. And he's like, look, like U.S. households, they, they just don't even recognize how much stuff they're locked out of and how much yeah. wealth they're not making because they're locked out of it. Sure. No, I, I think that's just ridiculous. I mean, I, have you been looking at some data as far as the emerging markets as well, or because um, I know you know I, I actually was able to find a link that had the accredited investor roles for like the UK and, and um, East Asia. And, you know, some of them are similar to ours, but I don't know if you have any other data, data points cross border, how, how it works or how the investment ecosystem is. Um, yeah, based on not, not as in depth, but yeah, but I know that Eastern Europe, or excuse me, Western Europe is really, you know, it's still founded on many of the same kind of regulatory principles as yeah. the U S is. Sure. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, like, at least with what we're doing, I guess I haven't really said what Sweater even is, right? How about yeah. I say what Sweater is real quick? So Sweater is a venture fund that we've designed so that anyone can invest into it. So we, yeah. uh, you know, instead of a $500,000 minimum check or 100000 or whatever, it's a $500 minimum check to set up an account. So it's actually more like uh, a mutual fund in its behavior than like a traditional venture fund. We pull money from lots of small checks, lots of small individual households into a fund that's just like any other venture fund from that perspective. And then we invest directly in private companies and report back on them through mobile apps. So it's kind of like a Robin Hood sort mm-hmm. of an experience, but for or almost, I would say almost kind of like a better, company. is it kind of like a Betterman for, for venture? Cause Betterman is more like an ETF, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of like a venture yeah. index of, uh, you know, early, early stage companies across different themes or Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, You know, and out of the gates, we have one fund with one broad theme, right? But Mm -hmm. eventually we'll have themed funds and different stages and things you can specialize and put your money into. Um, But, you know, the long-term goal really is indexing the private venture-backed market. And Mm -hmm. no one's ever done it like that before. So it's definitely a unique approach to diversifying and getting exposure to the asset class while also having, you know, really reasonable uh, measures in place to protect everyday people. Yeah. But, but, and you know, what are the, what are the legal compliance things you have to think about? Because now you're taking money from non-accredited investors and retail investors, or is there like a license that you, that you have to have, or some type of, you know, classification as far as a fund to, to be able to take retail capital in the U S. Yeah. Yeah. So the basics are, um, it's this is where we're more like a mutual fund, uh, yeah, than like it. a venture fund. So if, if you look at the, a little bit of boring history for a second. So the mm-hmm. 1940 Investment Act is like this big umbrella and it touches every single financial instrument um, that's available in the United States for purchase. Uh, so within that, there's also these silos of very mm-hmm. different sets of rules that are pre-existing for both accredited and unaccredited investors. Yeah. Venture capital is one of those. Sure. Um, it was created with very specific requirements in mind back in the 70s when wealthy individuals, like super angels from the 70s, wanted to pool their money mm-hmm. and make investments in the next, in the, you know, because they had, they basically created the Intels and the Hewlett Packards back in the 60s. Yeah. They wanted to pool their money, but in order to pool their money, they had to deal with this big umbrella oversight. And they're like, that that's stupid. Like we can lose our own money let us pool our money with less oversight. And the SEC said, sure, that's fine, but you have to be accredited or qualified and you can only have a hundred people in a fund. And they said, sure, that's fine, whatever. And that's how VC was born. So for us, we're more just like, we're going up a level and complying Mm -hmm. with that 1940 Investment Act in its entirety, basically. And there are specific rules. So I guess you're kind of like, uh, you're classifying yourself as a mutual fund to kind of be... Yeah, it's more, guess, it's right? more like that. And we can be yeah. more specific in the future with the exactly sure. what that fund structure is called. Yeah. But yeah, it's a little bit more like that. It's called a public investment company is like a category. Yeah. And we do have, but we have more regulatory oversight requirements than a VC fund does. Sure. And that's fine. Like we just looked at it and said, well, if this is the price of opening the category, then mm-hmm. we'll, yeah. we're willing to pay the price. And we built a business model around it. Sure. And then you guys, um, do you guys charge a management fee similar to Betterment, the, the way the Betterment does? I'd say it's more actually akin to the venture community in that regard, mm-hmm. um, because unlike Betterment, I mean, Betterment can click a few buttons and invest, you know, 
$30 million across whatever they want, right? It's, it's much sure. more uh, efficient to manage. Where mm -hmm. in venture, I mean, we're running a venture fund, right? We've got to run the whole pipeline. We've got to yeah. do everything. And that's still a very manual process in the capital deployment side of things. Yeah. Um, so we take more like a traditional two and 20 ish, right? And sure. the, the framework around that is just a little bit different, but that's basically the same outcome. Got it. And then the the investors, do they, I, and, and I think what's interesting too, is I think you have some scouts. So the scouts can also be involved and um, there can be some chatter around an interesting deal and people can probably um, take that to an investment committee or build a community around that as well, I'm assuming, right? Oh yeah. 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 I mean, that's, so this is like kind of part of our ethos, right? Is that, yeah. um, everyday people are connected in just as well as really yeah. well-connected people just on a smaller scale, just like they have mm -hmm. less money, they have fewer connections. Those connections can sure. be very good. You know, every amazing founder has that, that former roommate, that colleague they worked with, that third cousin they see at that family reunion every four years mm -hmm. that finds out about what they're building before yeah. they're ever really that public about it. So our, our objective is to always have about 1% of our member base to be scouts across the country. So today yeah. we've got about 50 that are a part of this, mm -hmm. um, that are actively inside this private Slack group. Eventually that will all be built into the, the, the app experience. But you know, when we've got 100,000 members, we want 1,000 scouts across the country. And sure. you know, we're building the technology around it to allow for that deal flow to happen and those feedback loops and the ability to comment and for us to be able to tap on people who are experts mm -hmm. in their respective fields to help us make good decisions. Yeah, and then there could be you know principles or um, you know, junior partners that are helping to prioritize that deal flow and then bubble that up to the investment committee. Because obviously there's there's a whole sourcing and then screening process and then a vetting process. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of gets into the investment committee. Um, and I mean, the issue with venture, um, you know, which, which is, <laughs> which is an issue that all of us need to solve for is speed, right? So <sighs> getting from getting from sourcing to term sheet and uh, not taking too long. And, you know, I was just blown away. There's a, there's a video I'll, I'll share with just, uh, what Tiger Global is doing. I mean, they've got, they've got Bain Capital people that they've hired to really just streamline that process and they'll yeah. like overpay to get into the deal. So I think, um, you know, definitely with your platform, just kind of tech enabling that, I, I feel like that'll definitely, uh, get us a little closer to, um, to more velocity. Yeah. And that's definitely what we want. I mean, we want to be able to make decisions in two weeks or less for sure. And depending yeah. on the, the nature of the deal, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it was just funny, like, so, so sweater itself is a fintech company first, yeah. right? So the sweater sure. LLC, we're a fintech company. We've raised mm -hmm. money up here. We're raising more money. The fund itself is a totally separate entity and it's operated, contracted to operate by sweater LLC to actually run it. So it's called the cashmere fund. Sure. Um, and you know, what's funny is, you know, we're out raising money as well for sweater itself. Just laughing I, at I send a email to investors. Hey, we're clever like that, right? we got to have some fun here. We're a consumer yeah. brand. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have the cardigan fund one day and we'll have Love a sweater it. vest fund, I'm sure, you know. Um, but what makes me laugh is like, I send an email to an investor, someone that we even know really well. It takes them yeah. five days to get back to us. They schedule us two or three weeks out to have mm -hmm. even an exploratory call. They never open our deck to even look at it. Yeah, and they then they get on the phone with no information, and they want to talk through things. And it's like, what? And you complain? They complain about how hard it is to get into good deals. And it's like, my gosh, yeah. like you're operating like this, and like, of course you don't get into good deals. Like you're so arrogant about it, and you have such terrible process. How how can you expect to win good deals? You know, and it just makes yeah. us laugh because we want to move very fast and make decisions quickly. Because I've never been involved in a deal where my gut feeling after a couple of meetings with a founder wasn't the same feeling and conclusion I came to three or yeah. four weeks later or two sure. months later or whatever the case might be. How much percentage do you think, you know, along with, you know, like this is another fundamental inefficiency and issue, um, you know, there's arrogance, but then there's also just uh, bandwidth issues, right? Because you got one GP, you got two associates. Um, so you, you just can't, answer all the emails and get back to them, you know, because one, one deal, you may be in the middle of diligence, another deal, you're, um, you know, super busy, you know, having investment committees and putting together the memos. And, you know, it's yeah. just, it doesn't always behoove us to the structure of venture as well, because you only have that management fee to cover your costs, right? So, you know, the, the smaller you are as a fund, um, the, the limited amount of help you can get to, to deploy that capital. Yeah. So, you know, how much of that do you think it's more of a bandwidth issue, um, you know, with, with staffing to be able to kind of source and screen mm -hmm. 
Um, and you, you and I have kind of thought about some clever ways to do this with just community-based um, sourcing. But mm -hmm. um, do you think that's also a big issue, just not having enough boots on the ground to, to be able to find the deals? And, and yeah, respond? it's totally an issue. Yeah. And, and this is where, you know, uh, I'd say micro funds aside, if we set micro funds aside, say yeah. funds, you know, 50 million plus, sure. our incentive structure is, is inherently different, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. So while GPs say, I don't have the time to do this, you know, they're also going to be the ones getting, you know, 10, $15 million checks at the end of the whole thing. None of that is going into operating that business yeah. as a venture fund, right? They're, they're trying to operate everything just off the management fees. And the way that we're organized, we inherently don't have like a GP that has mm -hmm. a ton of incentive to win at the top of the pile 10 years down the road or whatever, you know, so all of that cost that, that comes from fees and, and helping to build a great portfolio is going into the operations of this thing, first of all, right? Sure. So we're incentivized in a very different way. But on top of that, because of the scale that we're going after this, I mean, think of like the difference between how cars were made before and after Henry Ford, you know, brought the production line online, right? Before, I mean, building cars, they were just doing it all one at a time and it took forever. And effectively, we the way we look at it is we, we're gonna create specialization, right? So we're gonna have people that specialize in just very specific portions of the process to bring deals all the way through, which will allow us to operate much more efficiently and at a higher scale with fewer bottlenecks, not no bottlenecks, but fewer bottlenecks than what typically sure. exists when the GP is the guy finding the deal, the guy screening the deal, the guy sitting on the board, the guy having to write investment memos, the guys pushing all the paperwork across the line to make it happen and on and on and on everything else, every hat that a GP has to wear. So you get, get you know, above that $50 million plus marker in a venture fund. And all of a sudden, you know, there's something different that can be had. And so that's part of what we're looking at. Like even sitting on boards, you know, like we're not going to have GPs that sit on boards. We're going to have specialists that sit on boards and all they do is sit on boards, you know, yeah. and they manage, they're more like customer success where they mm -hmm. manage 20 investments and they're there at their beck and call. Every time that founder calls them, they pick up the phone. You know, and so we're just thinking about that whole process differently because it's frankly kind of archaic the way that it's yeah. been done. And I'm surprised no one's really tried to operationalize it. Sure. One question I have just from a product standpoint, you know, because I, I have a lot of uh, fintech experience, you know, and, and a challenge I had a lot of times was the desktop experience and then making it make sense for tablet and then and then phone. Obviously, it's really an overview since you guys are mobile first. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're thinking through when it comes to like the user experience? Because obviously you want to have enough information for people, you know, and I, I think Betterment has mobile and desktop. Um, there's benefits to being mobile first because it's just kind of really concentrated in that one device that you have to focus on. But, you know, just as far as the digital experience, you know, do you ever face any challenges from from users on real estate and like, you know, just the level of information you can show and, and how you show it? Yeah, no, that, that's a great insight. Um, <laughs> luckily, we have a very talented UI UX designer that has helped yeah. us to keep our priorities straight. Sure. Um, and that goes worth every penny, just for the record. Yeah. Anyone that's building something complicated in a mobile app, get a world-class designer because it will make yeah. all the difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, the way we look at it, <clears throat> um, there's a lot that we want to unpack yeah. and be able to provide to people. But, you know, like before Robinhood launched, do you remember like back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, like the 2010, 2015 timeframe? when a lot of people said, you can't get all that into a mobile app, that's yeah. impossible, right? Like how could you communicate so much complex information about the stock markets in the mobile mm -hmm. app? And then Robinhood totally crushed it, right? I mean, yeah. they just keep things very simple and the way that you navigate through to find information you want is just super intuitive. Yeah. And so we have the same mentality. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of information that we want to be able to portray. Um, of course, I mean, there's a, a fairly involved signup process because we've got to be checking people for their backgrounds and anti-money yeah. laundering and other things where we're gathering information sure. and connecting to your bank accounts and stuff. But after you get through that, right, you set up an account yeah. and you're in there, we have four main objectives. You need to be able to actually manage your, you know, your investments. And so people can drop money in whenever they want. They can mm -hmm. also be on a monthly subscription and continue to yeah. invest. So you can manage all that, see all your returns, see the nav as it's happened over the course of whatever periods of time and, and be able to dissect your investment itself. And then there's a section just for portfolio companies. So all the information about every investment we've ever made. And that's where we're like very proactive. Um, yeah. you know, this isn't like an annual report where we tell you what's happening in the portfolio or even a quarterly one. Every time we get information, we're feeding the portfolio overview on every company with data as it's happening. And we're very proactive and very video-based and media-based on that mm -hmm. front. 
Um, yeah. And then we have two other sections. One is education, uh, yeah. because we've identified that people just really want to understand the asset class better. And people will actually be able to access that before they ever set up an account if they want. So they sure. get comfortable with the category. Um, and that's just going to be education galore, right? And that's talking about how our fund works, but also how venture works and also how to build companies, you know, and yeah. that whole thing will be its own section that's very also media based. And then we have one that's more uh, like kind of entertainment based. Um, that's going to be telling founder stories and, and offering commentary on the industry. And I mean, there's so much to unpack on that side. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fun. And, you know, we're hitting it kind of light when we come out of the gates, but there's those components that um, will also be important. And that's like the foundation, right? Going into the future, there's going to be a ton of complexity that we can introduce into it that we have to keep simple and intuitive, like having more than one fund that you can, you know, theme that you can invest into. You know, I want to put yeah. some money into venture debt and I want to have fund of funds and I want an international exposure and whatever, like the ability mm -hmm. to, you know, take your monthly subscription and divide it between them and send them where you want, you know, but then there's even like feedback components where, you know, one big advantage we're going to be able to bring to the table, definitely at scale um, is that we have all these regular people that are part of our network yeah. and they're ultimately the people making purchasing decisions for their households and for their businesses. And so our ability to tap into that and not just have them be people that give us money, but also people where we get information, we can do validation work. They are the people that are going to be the early buyers of products of companies we invest into and to be able to tie all that together in a sophisticated way where we can have feedback loops and the ability to accelerate our company's time to market mm -hmm is also going to be built into the experience, right? And we have to do a good job of that. Sure. Have you thought about how to keep the venture fellows, uh, are they are the venture scouts or fellows? Scouts, yeah. So scouts. how do you keep them? You know, one, one thing that, you know, I've been thinking about too is like a leaderboard, right? I've tried that in the past and, and uh, you got to stay on top of it. But, you know, how can you motivate them to be super hungry? Can you, can you offer some economics to, to the carry? Because um, you can probably do like a GP, you know, some points to the GP or something like that, however you want to do it. But, um, you know, what, what are some thoughts on just kind of motivating people to be super hungry to source the best deals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, a lot of that. I'd say it's two sides. It's economics and it's yeah. community. Sure. Um, and the, the economics part is something that we're hammering out the details with, with mm -hmm. the SEC right now. But it's basically, as we see it, it's part of our cost structure for conducting a deal the same way that we have to pay legal fees. We are also paying sourcing fees, you know, uh, fees, so to speak, right? In order to have um, yeah. these leads be able to come in at scale. Sure. Um, so there's that component. And, you know, we want that to be as generous as we can make it, mm -hmm. you know, within the economics of the deal. Yeah. Um, on the other side, there's community though, right? And like to your point about leaderboards and, and other things, right? we found that people really want education. They want exposure to understanding how this stuff works. Cause especially within the community we're building, you don't have to be an expert in venture mm -hmm. in order to be qualified as a scout. You can be a regular person, a software engineer working at Rivian, you know, and you just happen to be living in San Francisco and you see startups all the time. Right. And so yeah. you want that, that kind of exposure and they see it as a cool thing, a bragging rights, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to get smart about it. Um, in addition to making the economics. So there's education, there's community, there's conversation, there's picking deals apart, seeing how we're making decisions and providing transparency to that are all, you know, elements, components that we're building into the system as we speak. Yeah, no, that's exciting. And uh, do you guys have a planned uh, time that you guys are looking to, um, to, to launch maybe a first version? Are you guys already out on the app store or? Yeah, so we're finalizing the technology is going to be out here in about four or five weeks. Um, and then the SEC final step is is here in about a month as well. So yeah. we're opening up a private beta uh, mm -hmm. probably in the second half of Q4. Yeah. Uh, for people it's got to be in winter. In actually you got, you're the sweater. I know, right? We, we're giving sweaters, everybody. I mean, sweater weather's coming, right? That's what we say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we'll be doing that the second half of Q4 and actually transacting. You know, we'll probably have a thousand people or so set up accounts and actually move money and invest into the fund. It'll be yeah. fully live, fully vetted and everything else and SEC mm -hmm. approved. Uh, but then we'll do a public launch in Q1, probably late January yeah. or early February. Yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, what, what are some of your, what are some of the biggest trends that you're seeing in venture as a whole, just kind of, you know, with, with unbundling, you know, we're starting to see mm -hmm. more people just launch SPVs, you know, people, people yeah. are launching syndicates, um, you know, and, you know, we've talked about my emerging manager program. So there's just a lot of people that want to go off and start their own funds. Right. I mean, a fund essentially similar to you as a startup, right. I mean, they're, they're building a new brand, they're building a community. 
um, and they have some type of thesis that thesis that they believe. So some of the things I'm seeing is just more people launching syndicates, more people um, launching yeah. funds. So the work that you're doing is super important. Um, anything else, any other high level trends that you're seeing as far as unbundling VC? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I love the solo fund manager trend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, it just makes it so accessible. I mean, even I know. three or four years ago, that wasn't even really plausible you know, when I, know. I was looking at doing this. And so I love seeing that because it's gonna open up the opportunity for smart, very ambitious people to be able to grab a hold of that. So whether they organize syndicates or they put together a rolling fund or yeah. a traditional fund, right? With just a smaller amount or whatever, like the, the ability to get that stuff set up and moving is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many new dynamics that are now readily accepted. You know, like, I mean, you could have a small fund and then you could have a very heavy syndicate strategy that's a part of it. Like we see one of those right now in New York and they've probably got, you know, 30 million under management. But when they pull together syndicates, they can write $10 million yeah. checks in a single deal, you know? know, and the fund put in a million or million five and then their LPs came in and crushed another 8 million and threw it all down. I mean, it's incredible, yeah. you know, and ultimately that's what the LPs really want. They want direct exposure. Um, I read this really interesting report a few months ago about, um, LPs views of emerging managers. And so, I mean, it went beyond though, the typical surface level of, you know, do you like emerging managers or not? It asked that question. And in this particular survey, it was like 70% said they were planning on uh, actually writing checks into emerging managers. But then they went deeper than that and asked, well, what's your motivation for doing it? And the, again, the surface level as well, you know, there's reports indicating that emerging managers outperform the broader venture category on average, which is positive. But then they went even deeper. And what they really want is direct access to deals. Yeah. Because they're way more likely to get direct access into a deal through an emerging manager mm -hmm. who can make room for them than going through a traditional fund that's like, yeah, you know, we'll let you know whether or not we can make some room for you, but just plan on not sure. is basically the status quo from the last 40 years. So it's really interesting to see those dynamics changing. I love the syndicate mm -hmm. rolling fund models and yeah. emerging managers. Um you know, so, but then in general, I think that deal flow is another area that just has tremendous potential. I see scout networks popping up all over the place. Um, and I think that there will be a lot to motivate those networks to actually stay live and to be productive in the long run. But assuming that you can make it through that and that you can create a community that's sustainable, I think access to deal flow is going to be even more I, I guess, readily available than it's ever yeah. been. Like even looking at AngelList and stuff. Like, I mean, I love AngelList. They've done so much, including, you know, helping to manage and streamline rolling funds and, and syndicates, and whatever else. But like, they never really hit the head on solving the deal flow problem, which is why I think they were originally founded, really. Um, and so I think that there's still an opportunity there. I I'm excited to see what will continue to come out of that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the deal flow is really the key. And a lot of times there's a couple different motivations. I've been researching this a lot, especially with the emerging manager program, right? Sometimes there's LPs that just see potential in someone similar to like how you and I see a founder and we just really love their mission. We want to back them. Um, a lot of times it's for education on a certain sector. So for me, I'm really excited about climate change, but I don't really know anything about it. So I'd rather you know, learn from a GP that's invested, you know, a lot of capital into different, in different deals. And, you know, I, I think to, to get access, a lot of times you don't have the means or the networks or the mechanisms to access those networks. So hold on. <laughs> I was able to hold them over for 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, so y y all, all the things you said make sense and I totally agree. And, um, we've actually been putting together some of our community building events around the deals. So some of the events that we're hosting with GPs along with LPs have been really about showcasing a hot deal. And then that's really kind of, mm -hmm. um, a great way to showcase your ability to source and screen amazing deals. And that, that's a great way to tee up a conversation because as exciting as it can be um, to talk about, you know, your fund and your mission, um, really the underlying assets and the, the opportunities um, that you have access to that can also excite people. And most people um, recommend to have those terms in your LPA. So, you know, those co-investment rights and those abilities to, to direct, definitely directly yeah, um, yeah. allow it through the GP structure. But you make a good point too. the the SPVs that you can do for, uh, you know, just 
sidecar allocations and then also just um, pro rata. So there's a couple of funds that just focus mm -hmm. only on buying up pro rata shares. And, you know, most likely those, those deals are going to get from series A to series B and they, they have those rights. Um, so, you know, they can offer those up as an SPV, which is um, mm -hmm. additional icing on top of the, uh, on, on the cake. So. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we, you know, I mean, speaking about like emerging fund managers and trying to get your fund off the ground and everything else. I mean, it's incredibly difficult if you haven't been working for another VC fund and have a track record, as they say. Yeah. Um, so the way that we're cracking that nut um, is we put together what we call a deal board. Um, and so we're actually bring, actually bringing in deals either through our own network or through the scouts that we're working with. Uh, and we go through a basic screening process to get to the point of basically saying, you know, is this company good enough that we would actually conduct real due diligence on it? Uh, mm -hmm. Does it have, you know, the, the venture DNA for us to be mm -hmm. able to take it seriously and align with our mission and whatever else? Um, and we're lining that thing out and basically saying, you know, these are companies that we would invest in. And we haven't actually put money into them. We're, we're supporting them in other ways, right? And trying to make connections. Yeah. You know, we we paid for access to PitchBook. And so, you know, like mm -hmm. we're helping to curate lists for them to go and pitch and where we actually have relationships for making introductions and trying to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, you know, we have a list of 20, 25 companies that are like, we would likely make investments in these pending that there aren't any issues underneath the surface that we're not aware of. Yeah. Um, and it, it's actually resonating pretty cleanly with our, mm -hmm. our VC partners, um, which is refreshing, right? Because at least it doesn't really resonate with everyone. Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. There's still plenty that are like, oh, you haven't deployed a hundred million dollars, then I'm not going to talk to you. And that's kind of the old school venture, but the, the new school, like the evolving side of the venture community, uh, I think respects that because you're showing process, you're showing relationships, you're showing judgment, even though you didn't actually place the money yet. Um, yeah. And I found that that's a good way to kind of get your foot in the door and show that you do know what you're talking about. Yeah. And there's a big buzzword in tech, you know, building in public. So a lot of these people that are building their funds, obviously there's some things that you can and can't talk about depending on your classification, right? If you're a 506C, you can definitely um, talk about your fund and, and solicit mm -hmm. if you're not, you know, obviously a lot of those things, um, you have to kind of make sure you're careful about, but, you know, building in public, as far as just, you know, communities that you're building a, a lot of GPs, some of the things that I've been seeing in our emerging manager program is, you know, GPs building special calculators for founders and for other emerging managers and mm -hmm. just building those resources that people can download and click and interact with. Um, that just makes people want to follow you because they're, they, they, they assume that you're going to put out more of that stuff. Um, yeah. So truly yeah. adding intrinsic value to the community. And, you know, if you, you know, there's a handful of VCs that you could probably, you know, follow on Twitter and get a lot of that education and, Everything is on YouTube and Twitter these days. You just, there just isn't somebody that's stitching it together in an organized way. Um, <laughs> I think if you can do right. that, you know, from a media channel standpoint, you know, I think that's definitely, that's definitely helpful because that'd be a compliment to, um, to the, uh, the trades or I guess the, the allocations that they're making into, into those indexes. So. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, and I mean, to just, kind of pile on that that point of um, of being public mm -hmm. about your ability to think about the category. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really heavy on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I personally can't keep up with Twitter. You have to yeah. be way too real time. And I just, yeah. I don't have the time for that. But I found that on LinkedIn, I can actually get fantastic reach, build a very curated audience um, and provide the type of insight that I want on the timeframes that I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this year we were just, my team went back through this and just on LinkedIn, I've had almost 7 million views and interactions with my posts. Yeah. And it's fantastic. I mean, it's like I'm curating this whole audience all over by itself. And I've yeah. got a mix of all kinds of things that I talk about, but you know, probably about 30% of it is venture specific and building mm -hmm. company specific. Yeah. And it works. I mean, like you have to be consistent. You have to talk about real things. You have to demonstrate that you have an opinion and an insight about things and not just regurgitate garbage memes and obvious content. Yeah. But if you can do it and you do it consistently, um, people really come to respect you and elevate, it elevates your ability to gain credibility very quickly with people. Mm -hmm. Totally worth it. Yeah, I totally agree. I've actually filled out a couple of your polls. So I think, I feel like polls are super <laughs> uh, highly engaging. Um, any, you know, what are some of the stats as far as just being a content creator? What, what do you think engages the most? Um, is it just really good articles or 
you know, brief overviews of something or have you seen the polls be um, a great way to get engagement? Uh, I think it depends on the platform you're on, specifically yeah. to, to LinkedIn, though. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the polls always get a ton of reach. I don't know what it yeah. is with LinkedIn and polls, but you have <laughs> to ask something that's a little bit provocative. Like if you do sure. like obvious garbage, you know, like people don't really like it. They want something to think about. Well, it's, it's like they either want to think about it or they want to see how everybody else answers. Yeah. So then they answer the question because they want to see where they lie. There's this inherent mm -hmm. curiosity with polls. It's really interesting. But I mean, I've had polls get hundreds of thousands of views on a regular basis. Uh, most of them get somewhere between 30 and 50,000, which is still great reach. But yeah. it, it spurs a lot of um, conversation. Like, I mean, just sure. this morning, I posted some silly one about, you know, if you were at a, a large gathering and the pizza showed up and it looked like there wasn't going to be enough for everybody, what would you do? Would you get to the front of the line and grab three pieces? Would yeah. you only take one or would you wait to make sure everyone else had it first? And there's like a hundred comments on it. Yeah. Like we're talking about pizza at a party. Yeah, it's not even venture you know, related, but it's a great way to just kind of build. It, it just kind of builds a little more authenticity and and um, just humanizes everything versus everything kind of being, being work related. So, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it's worthwhile. And I mean, I personally mm -hmm. think that I get the most value um, out of, thinking through, uh, you know, more of like the lessons learned, like mm -hmm. the school of hard knocks kind of yeah. experiences that I put out there. I don't always get the most reach on those, but I know that I develop the deepest relationships with the people that matter the most in my network on those. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't do those all the time, but those are the ones I like doing the most. And I feel like I have the deepest engagement with. Sure. And then I'm assuming, you know, one more thing that just came to my mind. So when you support these founders and you're investing with them, I guess you'd have an operating team that would kind of roll up their sleeves and, and also kind of support the, the founders if they need more on like mm -hmm. growth or tactical stuff or intros, I'm assuming but that would be, that would be out of the app, unless probably like a scout gets graduated, because that could be an interesting educational model too, right? People can graduate, they can start in sweater, build some skills, um, almost like a skill based economy, and then mm -hmm. prove themselves and almost get promoted and then the top performing scout could be your your talent pipeline as well, right? How you hire people. I don't, I don't know if you've been thinking about that too. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. No, 100%. And yeah. I mean, there's like with all startups, right? I mean, yeah. there's a crawl, walk, run mentality to how we build into this. But 100%, mm -hmm. I mean, for, you know, on the capital deployment side of what we do, that's absolutely going to be a great place for us to go out recruiting. And matter of fact, we've had a lot of people that express interest in working mm -hmm. with us. And yeah. we're like, look, we're not hiring now, but come be a scout. We'd love to yeah. uh, have you be part of this. And you, you know, you got to, they've got to understand that we're watching. Right. And it's yeah. a great way to stay close to us and show that they're dedicated. Um, but I mean, that's the interesting thing on the other side too, uh, that we've identified that founders are very interested in mm -hmm. is that we have all these people that are potential talent for our companies as well. Yeah. You know, and you know, part of what we're going to have people marking on their profiles as you know, we get into the versions two, three, four of, of the product is people's ability to say, yeah, I'd be, I'm willing to work for a startup in this region and in mm -hmm. this category and at this stage. And so when our own, you know, companies have the, the, the desire at, at their series B to go and find an incredible, you know, VP of marketing mm -hmm. for a SaaS company, we've already got a list of people that are willing to work in Colorado at that stage with this skill set that they can automatically talk to. And we can load that up at scale. Yeah. So we're really excited about that too, because talent mm -hmm. is so hard in companies these days. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, well, we got five minutes left. Uh, you know, anybody, if you guys want to chime in with a question, feel free to, you know, share that out and we'll, we'll take the question. And, um, and I always ask this at the end of every interview, Jesse, any, you know, we went through a lot of really great life lessons, um, but anything that comes to mind from a mentor or just uh, someone that you look up to could be a, a relative or just someone in business that, um, that you really respect um, any, any life advice that you got from any of those people uh, for us to take away to, for us to take away with, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. You know, I actually just had a close mentor of mine passed away about a week ago and I was at his funeral last Friday and, uh, I was reflecting on some of the things that he taught me. And one of the things, and this might just seem so obvious, but he helped me through some career transitions, uh, particularly one after I had a startup that I failed pretty mm -hmm. miserably at. I was trying to figure out what I needed to do next. And one of the things that he helped me understand was how to be true to what my strengths are and true to myself, which mm -hmm. sounds you know, maybe obvious, 
But when you get caught in a situation in your life where things haven't gone well, I think we have this natural tendency to want to conform to whatever the world tells you you're supposed to be. You're supposed yeah. to fit in this box. And so we want to go and put ourselves back in the box mm. so that we yeah. find safety and security and predictability again. And he really pushed me to say, to look beyond the problem that I had right then, which was frankly feeding my family. Yeah. It was a very serious situation. And to look beyond and think two or three steps ahead to, to bring my head up and look forward and say, what am I going to do now to set myself up for what I'm going to do in you know a year, two years, three years, yeah. and make sure that I'm still heading down the path where I want to be and not just like conform and go take a corporate job because they're going to pay sure. me 150 K a year and it's going to be stable. Um, and it's really because of him that I ended up where I'm at now, because yeah. without that influence at that moment, I probably would have caved. I put myself in a really bad situation financially and I, was kind of freaked out about it. You know, I'm like, yeah. I've been taking risks my whole life. I've been an entrepreneur in a lot of different scenarios, but he helped me to understand that and to, to not get lost in the risk or the pain of a failure in the moment. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think um, sometimes, you know, launching a company could be just as risky as working for a company as well, because, it, you know, a lot of times there's factors that are out of your hands. And, you know, when we think a company is super stable, um, they may not, be that stable, you know, and, and, and you, you might think it's stable and then there's just a culture issue with you and the company and, and they have to let you go. So I, I feel like if you, if you double down on yourself and, you know, you have conviction, you know, hopefully you can, um, you know, at least achieve your goals and, and, and learn from the past lessons that you've learned. So definitely really good advice. Um, uh, but yeah, this was amazing. No, oh, go ahead, John. Um, thank you, Joel. Uh, Jesse, I hope I'm pronouncing your first name correctly. Um, what is your expectations in the next three years? Financial, user base, investors, uh, what are your expectations? Because you mentioned that um, you're going to pilot everything towards the tail end of this year, and then in Q1, um, you're going public. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll give you, a, we talk about our five-year goal more than three. I'd have to back into what three is. So let me tell you about five. So our five-year goal um, with a little bit of context. So Robinhood's got about 18 million users now. Acorns, if you're familiar with them, they have 10 or 12 million users. Um, our objective is to get 250,000 subscribers in five years um, that are committing on average a hundred bucks a month into our platform. So, or into the fund itself. So at, when you extrapolate that out, that would bring in 300 million a year of new AUM every year, which is kind of like raising a billion dollar fund on a typical you know, three or four year fund cycle. Yes. Um, so that's our, our big objective. We wanna have a billion under management in five years with 250,000 subscribers bringing in at least 300 million a year. Excellent, very, very nice, good, very uh, sound business model. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Jesse, best of luck and, you know, really love what you're doing and um, uh, just excited to collaborate with you and learn more about, you know, the updates that are coming up and and hopefully we can all sign up as uh, as beta users and uh, and test it out. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome to sign up on the list. Um, it's sweaterventures.com. You can join the wait list there. Great. You know, we've got 23,000, 24,000 people on that list now. Um, excited for, for what's coming. And I, I do just want to mention, because I know we talked about this briefly before. Uh, one of the things we'll be investing in is in other fund managers, emerging mm -hmm. fund managers. And so I'm excited to continue the conversation with you on that. Sure. I'm a big believer in solo managers. I was in that those you know that same mentality myself when I started this whole thing. Um, and so we're excited about allocating a portion of these funds into emerging managers so that you can yeah. get that that jump start and have that strong foundation to do what you need to do. And so we're excited about that too. Sure. Well, super excited and. Uh... Hope uh, hope we catch up soon, and everybody else have a good day. All right, hey, thanks, All right. Joel. We'll see. Take you. care.